everyone. I think we're going to try to get started. Uh, please grab some coffee or other refreshments at the back if you'd like. Um, apologies for the delay this morning. I think we had a couple of cold weather related false starts that um, delayed a couple of us, including myself and one of our guests, from getting here um, right on time. So thank you uh, very much for your patience. Um, very good to see you all here this morning. I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion on a very important subject, um, the UK's new strategy for global health. Um, let me take a moment to introduce two of our three guests. Um, we have with us uh, this morning Dr. Robin Niblett, uh, an old friend of CSIS, actually a former vice president of CSIS and head of CSIS's European program. Robin is now the director of Chatham House, also known as the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And he has written and lectured extensively on transatlantic relations. And Robin, it's so nice to see you back here this morning. Um, we also have with us this morning uh, Dr. Nick Banatvala. Uh, Nick is currently the head of the Global Affairs Department at the UK's Department of Health and a senior lecturer at Imperial College. Uh, Nick has also spent a significant part of his career at DFID and has worked at the British NGO Merlin uh, with a lot of experience, I believe, in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. Um, uh, we're going to have a third panelist join us um, later this morning, uh, well known to most of you, I think, Dr. Chris Elias from PATH. Um, Chris is the CEO of PATH and um, is a, has a very distinguished career as both a researcher and implementer um, in global health. Uh, a word or two about our format. Um, We'll start off with a few introductory words from Robin um, on the context and why uh, this is an important moment for the UK in introducing its new global health strategy and about a very interesting new relationship that's being forged between the UK government and Chatham House on global health. Nick then will give us an overview of the strategy itself. Um, then we're going to have a short conversation among the panelists up here on the, um, the stage. And then we hope to have about 20 to 30 minutes um, for Q&A. Uh, we are going to have to end promptly at 11, um, so my apologies if we're not going to be able to take all your questions, but we can certainly adjourn um, to the area outside the room here and continue the discussion if we want. Um, before I give the floor uh, to our guests, just three quick points I'd like to make about why I think it's important um, that we are having this discussion this morning. Uh, first, I think we all know that we're at a critical moment here in the U.S in terms of the future of our global health investments. Uh, the last eight years has seen an unprecedented increase in the um, leadership and the resources the U.S. has directed to this field. And the challenge now before us is how to sustain and accelerate those investments uh, in a very complicated environment with a new political leadership here in Washington. Uh, second, we have a very long history of U.S., U.K., engagement and leadership in global health, and we can learn from that. Um, this is an ideal time for us to stop and look at how our two countries have done things differently and what it is we can take away from that experience and how it can inform our work going forward. Um, and third, there are many challenges out there that we're only going to be able to best address if we address them together. And I think that um, goes from things like how we sustain the important work of the Global Fund, look at its financing needs down the road, um, to how we make the G8 a more effective mechanism for advancing global health interests. Um, finally, uh, Nick and Robin, as significant as your visit is here today, I think we have to acknowledge that there's also another visitor from the UK in Washington this morning. Um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown is here as well. Uh, I believe later today he'll have his first meeting since the election um, with President Obama. Uh, that's certainly going to be a very significant discussion. Uh, the Prime Minister has said he wants it to focus mostly on global economic issues. That's totally understandable. But I believe over the weekend he also made a call for something he was calling a new partnership of purpose between the U.S. and the U.K. And he talked about the importance of that type of partnership forging a global new deal that would focus both on the economic crisis but also on issues around poverty, disease, um, and global inequities. Uh, so I think that makes your visit even more timely, and we're very anxious to hear what you have to say. We look forward to learning from you, and welcome. Robin. Thanks very much, Lisa. Thanks for those uh, uh, opening remarks. Um, and it is great to be back here. And we're particularly excited um, 
certainly from a Chatham House perspective, to be able to re-engage with CSIS uh, and on this uh, particular topic as well. Um, great to work with you, Lisa. It'd be good to work with Steve. Um, delighted to see you've got this uh, center up and running uh, here at CSIS. Um, and uh, we are particularly excited uh, at Chatham House to be launching a center on global health and foreign policy. Um, and we will have actually a launch conference taking place uh, in London next week on March 10th and 11th, which uh, Nick will be part of, along with a number of uh, stakeholders, let's say, both from the government, from the health sector, from the private sector, from, from, from around the world. Um, and I, I'm not a health expert. I don't come at this from the health angle. Uh, but we were discussing yesterday with Lisa and with Steve um, that I think it's almost as if uh, organizations like Chatham House that have worked traditionally on international affairs um, are becoming aware of how health fits into so many dimensions of other aspects that we would traditionally consider to be part of international relations, from uh, post-conflict reconstruction to uh, changing impacts and externalities of climate change uh, to development policy um, to trade policy. Uh, and from our perspective, as we think about uh, the mission that I think most of our institutes tend to have, which is in various forms to try and build a, build a better, more prosperous, more secure, more just world, um, health ends up being a component, a larger or smaller, but often a pivotal component uh, within uh, each of these broader uh, areas that we would traditionally consider part of international affairs. So what we're looking forward to doing is by having this um, uh, center on uh, global health and foreign policy at Chatham House, uh, to be able to integrate uh, the health dimension into a number of the areas of work that we would traditionally do. Um, obviously, our opportunity to do this wouldn't have arisen um, without, uh, I, th I think, the kind of vision that's been laid out in the Health is Global Strategy document that Nick Bannett-Vala really was the driving force behind. Uh, this is an initiative that has started earlier in 2007 with a, with a first document uh, that set the scene, but this more recent document that he's going to be talking about in a minute um, really does put uh, health uh, and global health within a much broader framework. I mean, there are five components which we'll be talking about, uh, one of which is better global health security. Uh, and Chatham House's uh, role within this and the center we've created is very much a, uh, as a subset of that better global health security um, uh, ambition. Um, and there are a number of subsets that are laid out within the document, uh, which I think you'll be getting access to. Uh, and we hope to be able to touch on a number of them, as I mentioned earlier, uh, using our work on climate change, for example, using our work on post-conflict reconstruction, uh, thinking about trade policy and access to medicines, um, to move maybe into some new areas, uh, counterfeit medicine, uh, and how that fits in with global organized crime and other risks uh, to security, uh, coordination between different governmental agencies uh, on controlling pandemics, whether uh, deliberately caused or, or organic and natural, um, to think about the linkages between food security and health, something I know that you're working on uh, at CSIS, which we're also uh, doing quite a bit of work on right now uh, at Chatham House. And perhaps most importantly, given our role as an international affairs organization, um, trying to think uh, about building interlinkages and bridge building between what is inevitably a very stovepiped uh, area of, uh, of governmental inquiry. Health does cut across as I think Nick will say in a minute, all areas of, of UK uh, government policy. Uh, but its primacy uh, is something that has to be struggled for in areas where it probably should be primary, and uh, its pure attention is hard to always capture in areas where it should be attended to. So I think uh, as an organization that tends to work much more broadly uh, in areas of international affairs, foreign policy, as it might have been known, um, the chance to bring health into it is part of what I think the British government uh, has set itself a task to do, something that we're very pleased uh, to be able to support it on, something that I think uh, will only become meaningful uh, and productive to the extent to which we can build linkages outside the UK uh, mm -hmm. to the United States, to other countries, and therefore working, as I said, with the CSIS Centre, uh, that seems like an absolutely natural partnership, especially for me, uh, with my old CSIS connection, uh, and also knowing that CSIS is one of those kind of can-do think tanks as opposed to just a studying and uh, an observing think tank. Um, so uh, really all I wanted to do with these introductions was A, to say, we're delighted to have this opportunity to work with the UK government uh, on uh, its Health is Global strategy to fulfill, hopefully, a component part of it uh, to make sure that health remains uh, not uh, the second or third or fourth, fourth, fourth cousin, 
but a central part of uh, British thinking and international thinking about uh, prosperity and security internationally. Um, and look forward to working with all of you on it, and hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. But in any case, Nick, you've been introduced already, but um, thanks for the opportunity and look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin, Lisa, and Steve, and everybody. It's a real pleasure to be um, here today. What I thought I'd do in 20 minutes or so is give you, if you like, a whistle-stop tour over the global health strategy. You know, there's so many documents in this world that people have on their desk. Um, if at the end of this you can say, well, okay, you understand what it says, it means that that's one thing less off your mind, and that you can take it back, and you know it's there, but at least you won't feel that you've got to plough through it all, each and every page. So that's my objective. And then we'll have a discussion where you can then challenge me on whether it really is going to make a difference and what are the real differences to other work that we've done at the moment. So on September the 30th of last year, uh, we had four uh, ministers together who launched Health is Global. Uh, the Secretary of State, so Cabinet Minister Alan Johnson from Department of Health, uh, Mark Malik Brown, who many of you will know of, uh, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, our Department of State, if you like, um, Gillian Merrin, Minister from the Department of International Development, USA equivalent, um, and Dawn Primarello was there at, at the event as well from the Department of Health and our Minister of Public Health. So we had a, a number of stakeholders were at that e e event. And I guess the first question is, well, why does the UK need a strategy to address global health? And succinctly, it's because if the UK is to protect the health of its population, harness the benefits of globalisation, and make the most of its contribution to health and development across the world, it needs a clear, coherent, and coordinated, indeed consistent, approach to the many issues that influence global health. And as Gordon Brown said in the foreword to this document, this strategy is one way for Britain to help build a better and fairer world. Global health, he argues, is not just a question of morality, but of security. In today's new global era, flows of commerce, information, and ideas transcend traditional borders. But so too does climate change and pandemics like influenza or SARS. Clearly, the first duty of any government has to be to ensure the safety of its people. But increasingly, we all recognize that this can no longer be achieved in isolation. It's in our interest not only to uphold the values that underpin our policies at home, says Gordon Brown, liberty, security, and justice for all, economic opportunity, and environmental protection shared by all, but to promote them actively abroad. And nowhere is this more important than in the field of global health. So, as Robin said... The Proposals for Health is Global, published in 2007 by the Chief Medical Officer, Sir Liam Donaldson. And the concept for this actually goes back several years. And the articulation for the need for the Global Health Strategy, important point, was actually came from outside government. An interministerial group chaired by the Minister for Public Health in the UK oversaw the production and publication, and will oversee the delivery of the strategy, with ministers right across government participating, and a high-level cross-government officials group is the working level for the develop was the working level for the development of this piece of work. A number of stakeholder workshops were undertaken to try and articulate what people outside thought should go into this strategy, and there were written responses and published. Uh, commentaries in the Lancet, BMJ, and other uh, journals. Now, one of the things that stakeholders said was they thought that we needed an ambitious document, but at the same time, it needed also to be sufficiently specific with clear deliverables. And what they said is it would be incredibly useful if you could articulate a series of principles that would guide the way that you work in government. And so we set out ten principles... The first one, which I think is extraordinarily ambitious, is that we will set out to do no harm and, as far as feasible, evaluate the impact of our domestic and foreign policies on global health to ensure that our intention is fulfilled. Number two, 
basing policies and practice on sound evidence. And that's a really big ask if we think about what the significance of, of that is. The third thing for the UK, which is rather new, but you in the US have developed this quite considerably, is thinking about the links between health and foreign policy. And we will discuss that again in a little bit later. But using health as an agent for good in foreign policy. The next one is promoting outcomes that support achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. So this no longer becomes a DFID mantra, poverty eradication and the Millennium Development Goals, but it's something right across government. And we know that number 10, and we know that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office are committed to that, but it's now all government departments that need to ensure that policy and practice don't undermine the Millennium Development Goals. Promoting health equity is something which we have for a long time promoted and worked with the Commission for Social Determinants of Health most recently. And that's a principle. We want to ensure that the effects of foreign and domestic policies on global health are much more explicit and that we are transparent where objectives of different policies may conflict. Because as sure as eggs are eggs, there will be conflict. And if we can at least say that, well, we recognize this, but this is what we're doing about it, then at least that's a more transparent approach. Working with strong and lead effective leadership through the multilateral system, again, something that UK um, cares passionately about. Learning from other countries' policies and experience in order to improve health and well-being of the UK population. Recognizing that the opportunity is not just what we do for others, but there are huge learning opportunities on the quality issue, on health systems, on determinants of health from others. Protecting the health of the UK proactively by tackling health challenges that begin outside our borders. Coming back to that initial comment from the Prime Minister. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, working in partnership with other governments, multilaterals, civil society and business. And that's why it's so important that, that Robin is here and I'll describe some of the other initiatives as we go through this uh, presentation. So the first thing one has to decide when one's putting together a strategy is what are going to be the criteria you're going to use to determine the priorities. And these were the five that we selected. <coughs> that the area had a direct link to an important global health issue or was, of course, a global health issue uh, of importance in its own right. Secondly, that the UK has particular expertise and experience in working in this area or able to influence others. That delivery required effective cross-government working. So if one government department was responsible for one area but none others were involved in it, fine. This wasn't going to become a mass compendium of everything that existed. That we could identify discrete outcomes. That was about the specificity that stakeholders called for. We want measurable outcomes so we can see how you're doing. And then finally, we were also clear that we wanted to see the UK standing to benefit from this. So the five areas for action that were selected are here. Better global health security. Stronger, fairer, and safer systems to deliver health. More effective international health organizations stronger, freer, and fairer trade for better health. Can you have all of those at one time? I don't know. Strengthening the way we develop and use evidence to improve policy and practice. And we identified 41 we wills, deliverables, commitments, if you like, with lead and supporting government departments. And at the back of the annex of the document, there are those 41 with one lead department for accountability except for one where we couldn't get agreement, and supporting departments next to them. And the five areas for action are linked to economic prosperity, security, and stability. And there are those first four columns, those four areas, and underpinning all those, strengthening the way we develop and use evidence to improve policy and practice. 
and this leading to improvement in the health of the UK and world's population. Again, again, the link there. And then finally, economic prosperity, security, and stability for all. Now, you go through each in turn. Better global health security, combating global poverty and health inequalities, tackling <coughs> climate change and environmental factors, tackling the effect of conflict on health and health care, reducing the threat from infectious diseases, and managing the health of migrants and tackling human trafficking. So some examples of we wills to combat global poverty and health inequalities. We will work with WHO, the EU, and others to take forward key recommendations from the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health and ensure that action to address these issues remains high on the international agenda. With regards to tackling climate change and environmental factors, we will work with international partners, in particular the WHO and the EU, to develop evidence on health impacts on climate change and use this to draw public and policymakers' attention to the potential health risks associated with climate change. With regards to reducing the threat from infectious diseases, we have provided funding to the Health Protection Agency, if you like our equivalent of CDC, to increase UK and global health security and for them to do more internationally. We also said that we would publish and implement a new cross-government international pandemic influenza strategy. We have our domestic one. This is an international one that came out at the end of last year. With regards to take, tackling the effects of conflict <coughs> on health and health care, there are two dimensions to this. One is tackling the health impacts of violent conflict and chronic instability. The second one is the role of health and healthcare workers in preventing conflict and acting as a bridge to peace. A really big challenge here is coherence and consistency across government. For example, the role of the armed forces, be it in Iraq or Afghanistan, and the real risk or the perceived risk from politicization of activities. And even with joint acti uh, objectives, the need to retain distinct civilian-led and military-led activities. Now, what we say in the Global Health Strategy is the precise response to any given scenario will be specific to the context. But that makes me anxious, because is that the potential excuse for always saying why in a particular area we will have to perform in a particular way, or we cannot make any uh, firm guidance or principles in the way that we act. But I think we can move forward, and there are two opportunities that I will briefly describe. One is a cross-government joint stabilization unit with DFID, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defense, and the Department of Health that feeds into that in terms of what we actually are trying to do in countries with different um, government departments harmonizing activities. And then secondly, a joint academic NGO network, a fragile health and fragile states network, which we will want to work with in terms of developing guidance and policy. So that over the lifetime of this strategy, we have committed to developing more coherent and consistent policy on health and conflict. What will that look like? I hope that will look as a guidance, operational guidance, that people can see in the form of a, of a, a manual or a document. And to that extent, we have seconded an individual from the Department of Health into an NGO and academic unit to support that work. Number two, stronger, fairer, and safer systems to deliver health. Increasing finance for health systems with universal health care coverage. Stronger health systems through the international health partnerships. International health partnership. Number three, addressing the global workforce crisis, the 4.2 million missing healthcare workers, increasing access to medicines, technologies, and innovations, and increased patient safety. Number five, increasing sexual, reproductive, and maternal health. And finally, focusing on non-communicable diseases and injuries. So in terms of addressing the global workforce crisis, as a whole of government, we are committed to combating the global workforce crisis by becoming more self-sufficient 
in training our own healthcare workers. We will also support multilateral initiatives and codes of practice to promote self-sufficiency, effective development assistance, and innovative policies for health worker migration. We will provide effective development assistance to low-income countries to help them train and retain staff and work with others to ensure that fair healthcare worker migration policies are in place and adhered to. We will increase our support for distance learning resources for professionals in low and middle income countries. And currently we're doing a piece of work to try and establish what are the most effective approaches for distance learning. And finally, strengthen medical workforce development by seeking to expand the UK's training program for overseas doctors. Not for them to come and stay, but for them to have short periods of time in the UK before they return. A particular area of interest to many at the moment is the links between UK health establishments and overseas health establishments. And some of you will be aware of a report that was commissioned by Tony Blair and undertaken by Nigel Crisp, Global Health Partnerships, used not as in Global Health Partnerships, such as Gavi and the Global Fund, but in terms of partnerships and linkages between UK institutions and overseas institutions. How could the UK step up its contribution to supporting healthcare in developing countries? And a response was produced by the government, principally the Department of Health and DFID, but others as well, uh, looking at each of 16 recommendations. And I think there are one or two copies outside, and of course these are available on the web. We say we will support health systems to deliver high quality and affordable medicines, particularly through the Medicines Transparency Alliance and International Health Partnership. And both of those initiatives are more than just DFID run. Foreign Office, Business Departments, <coughs> Department of Innovation, Universities uh, and Skills, and the Department of Health as examples, partners. We will continue our commitment to emphasizing sexual, reproductive and maternal health. Many of you will be aware that there was an HIV strategy that was launched across government last year. And this year, there will be a uh, DFID-led strategy looking at maternal health for the next few years. One of the things that's very exciting about this particular document is a focus on non-communicable diseases and injuries because it is a hugely neglected area for many uh, development uh, agencies and development partners. And so what we say is that we will develop a clear action plan for the UK to scale up its efforts in tackling non-communicable diseases globally, including mental health and injury <coughs> prevention. And we will continue our work on key risk factors, for instance, by working with WHO to develop a protocol on the illicit trade in tobacco and to provide an internationally agreed approach for reducing the problem of tobacco smuggling. Now if we go to the third column, more effective international health organizations, the Prime Minister has, since he uh, came into office, had as one of his priorities a reformed UN system with an effective WHO. We will continue to push through this strategy for that, as well as supporting the EU play an effective role in global health, and for our own part, ensure that there is a coherent approach to resourcing health programs and projects in low and middle, in middle income countries and to the way that we resource international agencies. Many government departments resource WHO and resource other key partners. Let's make sure that we're doing that even more coherently and consistently. We say that we will work to ensure that reform of the international architecture supports stronger and more effective leadership coordinated action on health. And here is an example of a report which we produced uh, recently in response to a House of Lords, our upper house, uh, report on intergovernmental organizations. Diseases, no, no frontiers. How effective are international organizations in controlling their spread? And again, there's a copy or two um, outside there. We said that we would publish a first joint government, FCO, Department of Health, DFID, institutional strategy 
outlining how the UK will work with WHO. And that was published last week. And again, there are some copies out there uh, in a rather uh, uninspiring bound <coughs> form because we haven't had them printed as yet. We say that we will ensure that new projects and programs across government align with the principles of the International Health Partnership and UN reform and the Paris principles of aid effectiveness. That doesn't just mean DFID, it means right across the government. Number four, column number four, stronger, freer, and fairer trade for better health. Three areas here. Stronger, fairer, and more ethical trade in the health sector. Number two, a robust system of intellectual property rights used inevitably and flexibly to promote access to medicines. And thirdly, enhancing the UK as a market leader in well-being, health services, and medical products. We say that we will support the work of the British Medical Association-led Medical Fair and Ethical Trading Group. We will foster good practice in the NHS and private healthcare system and work with industry and others to encourage fair and ethical trade. We seem very unfortunate that if we are delivering healthcare to our own population, it is at the expense of the health of others. We say that we will continue to support the right of developing countries to make use of TRIPS flexibilities and to improve access to medicines. We will provide practical assistance to support this and promote innovative ways to use the intellectual property system to encourage innovation and access to medicines. For example, investigating patent tools for antivirals. Finally, number five, the one that underpins those four, is strengthening the way we develop and use evidence to improve policy and practice. We say that we will identify and support research and innovation that tackles global health priorities. We'll continue to do so. We will use evidence and innovation to strengthen policy and practice and maintain the UK as a global leader in research and innovation for health, well-being and development. We will work with the new UK Funders Forum for Health Research in Developing Countries and a new, relatively new initiative, the UK Collaborative for Development Sciences, which consists of different government departments, the MRC and the Wellcome as major funders of research in the UK to ensure better coordination of UK global health research. We also say that we will use the Government Office for Science Foresight Program Horizon Scanning Centre in the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills to identify future trends and important issues in global health with non-governmental partners. So, how are we going to implement and monitor progress? It's a five-year strategy. We're having each commitment led by one department. We have a senior officials steering group that meet regularly to assess progress and to try and iron out any inconsistencies and incoherence. Where that can't be done, we have an interministerial group that will A, drive forward delivery of the strategy, B, review the impact of government policy and funding on global health, C, enhance policy coherence. So when we think there's inconsistency, that is the forum to bring it to. And finally, monitor and evaluate health is global. As I said, this is a partnership. This is working with others. As Alan Johnson said when he launched this, this cannot be done by the UK government alone. We say that we will work with non-governmental partners when developing, implementing, and evaluating government policy. We will foster greater coherence and consistency of policy and action. And we will be work with non-governmental partners to be more transparent. We say that we will fund a new centre on global health and foreign policy at Chatham House. We say we will co-fund the emerging European Council on Global Health. We say that we will host regular partners forums to review the challenges and to assess the impact of Health is Global. And finally, we will hold stakeholder meetings prior to key multilateral events that impact on health. So, for example, before the WHO Executive Board and World Health Assembly, we have groups of people stakeholders who come together. And we have been increasingly trying to bring together different groups 
industry and the NGOs as one, rather than having separate meetings for those individuals, so that we can be more transparent together in terms of what we're trying to uh, achieve. More details, as I say, are available on the web, but uh, at this stage I'll stop and hand back to Lisa. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nick. That was a great presentation. <laughs> And extremely comprehensive, and I, for one, am very impressed um, by the scope of the efforts that you outline. Um, but before we go on to our conversation, I'd actually like to invite Dr. Chris Elias, please, to come up and join us. Welcome, Chris. Um, we, we did introduce you, even though you weren't with us <laughs> earlier this morning, but we're glad you're, we're glad you're here now. Um, so I, I think maybe I'll take the liberty um, as the chair of starting off with um, a first question. Uh, and it's a, a, a very basic question, um, and you are allowed to not answer it directly if you'd rather not. Um, but five years from now, how are you going to know you've succeeded? What are the most important, if you had to name the most important three or four things that you'd like to see in place, what might they be? And you won't be held to your answer. So, <laughs> I think that... Um, Although there are a number of deliverables and we wills that are there, um, and we will want to see all 41 of those, if you like, ticked off, and that will be a way. What I would like to see is people saying there is just more transparency in government. Actually, we feel that we are engaged much more in policy making. We feel that when you are thinking about approaches for development, or you're thinking about the way that you're going to work with the um, EU, um, or the way that you're going to work with WHO, we are increasingly consulted, and information on how you've gone about your business is fed back to us. Now, how do you measure that? It's kind of quite difficult. You can, you have these stakeholder forums, and you will start getting uh, the, an idea, you'll start getting some atmosphere as to whether people think that you're, uh, uh, you're actually doing that. So to me, it's, a lot of it is about that. The second thing I would like to see is that within government, there is more understanding about each other's perspectives. So that if you were, let us say, to have a survey of different people in government departments, they would be increasingly able to articulate where other people are coming from they would be increasingly able to articulate the links between health and foreign policy. And that's why I think some of Robin's um, work is going to be so important in bringing those disparate groups together to start speaking from a common message. Lisa, just, just uh, Nick, to come in on one point that, that is referenced um, in the document as a whole, this idea of creating um, global health impact assessment, that uh, the Department of Health is actually going to sort of provide a service, as I understand it, uh, to other departments to try and work out where the health dimension fits in within the particular domestic or foreign policy that they will undertake uh, as a way, I think, of, of doing what you just said a minute ago, which is starting to embed the awareness and so on. Uh, how's that going to go? How's it going? Obviously, this, this could be an important tool. It could be something that's resisted. What, what's, yeah. your, what's your take on that? Well, that's, that's interesting. We do have a commitment across government that when we are developing new policies, to do a health impact assessment. And up till now, that's been uh, about domestic health. And what we've said in this is that we're going to expand that to look at the global health impact of domestic and foreign policy. And uh, we, uh, in the Department of Health, will, will lead on that and support other government departments. It's not for the Department of Health to do the impact assessments for other government departments. But in terms of developing good guidance, looking at what is out there from WHO, from the EU, or other people, it will be for the Department of Health to do some work on that. And we have got one or two people who are working full time on that. But I think that's going to be a really tough one because it's challenging, it's difficult technically. Um, we don't have a lot of very good examples out there. Uh, it's going to be potentially an area where people feel that particular policies are going to be held up under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But I think it's another good example of where, you know, five years mm -hmm. from now, will we see that a number of domestic and foreign policies have been opened up to global health as well as domestic health impacts? Mm -hmm. yeah, it might be something that ends up being done more from outside as well as from inside, I would have thought. 
well, I from think us to others. I mean, you've set up, obviously, some objectives and challenges, and so others will start doing their own types of uh, assessments. Well, I think, that's, I think that's right. And I think that uh, whether or not this, this, this flies to some extent depends on how much other partners are going to be up for supporting us, constructively challenging us, uh, and helping us move forward in these, these, these different areas. Chris, you bring a number of interesting perspectives um, to this discussion, and you can take your pick from sure. which one you might like to comment. But I mean, I, for one, knowing the very important work PATH does in research and innovation and technology, um, would be interested in your thoughts on what you see in the strategy vis-a-vis -vis yeah. that set of issues and how this can take things further down the road. Yeah, well, first let me apologize for being late. I was on the train from New York, and um, and we had a frozen switch in Philadelphia, and so I had more time to look at the report, <laughs> even though I missed the, the, the beginning of your presentation. One of the questions that came out to me, particularly in the area of research, um, was, um, you know, first, let me say, I think it's a, it's a great vision, um, and it's a great effort to bring so many different um, UK government groups around, together around a, a coherent strategy. But one of the things I looked at, actually sitting on the train while we were not moving, was, you know, in uh, in the third in the one of the appendix in box 18, it, it maps the architecture of global health research funding in the UK, and it's you know the kind of map that you often see with these you know complex, um, multi multiple funders, multiple implementers, only about half of which is, if I understand it, is direct UK government. Um, so there's private sector partners, there are, by private sector meaning commercial sector, there are foundations, there are other funders. Um, and then there's the work in the UK is, as we experience, highly interrelated with the product development research that's being done in other countries through other complex global partnerships. So I guess the question I had in thinking about that is to what extent do you think that this will this and, and the more specific different research strategy will serve as a focal point for bringing together not just the government, but the non-governmental and commercial actors in the UK and perhaps even beyond. Um, I think you're right, first of all, to say that the architecture there is extraordinarily complex. And um, the, the editors and the printers came back to me on a couple <laughs> of occasions to say, are you sure that you really want this? Because it's a bit complicated. I don't think anyone will understand it. And I said, that's precisely the point. If people just look <laughs> at it and say, I don't understand this, then that's the, that's the point of that, uh, that, that, that diagram. And then what's interesting is one or two people came out and said, you know, you missed out this particular link or that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, I think that, that we have a, uh, a big opportunity to see how we can try and rationalize um, some of the work that we're doing. And certainly this UK Collaborative for Development Science that I was talking about is a very important way of doing that with a group of people that sit around the table and start to try and articulate the links. I think one of the big uh, challenges, again, is the way that we work with uh, developing countries on helping them with their research um, commitments and making sure that things are made even more complex for them. And I think the other thing which is really important that perhaps um, doesn't come out quite as strongly in there, but I'm increasingly committed to it, is thinking about how we work with uh, some of those middle-income and emerging mm -hmm. countries like the Indias and the China, who are going to be mm -hmm. right at the cutting edge of much of this research technology. And if they come into the, uh, the game increasingly, that has the potential for much, much benefit, but it's mm -hmm. also the potential for even more mm -hmm. chaos uh, and confusion. I guess that one of the things that probably I didn't stress enough in my presentation, but is worth saying, is the important links between um, global health and the Brazils, the Chinas, the Indias, increasingly important mm -hmm. players. And as they start ramping up their assistance um, over the next five years, we recognize they're going to be problems with the current economic climate, but over the next five years, it means that countries like the UK, I think, have got to increasingly start thinking, well, do we continue in engaging with our friends and family, if you like, our normal, like-minded people, or do we start trying to understand the culture and the environment that people like mm -hmm. India and China bring to the party? And I think much more of our time needs to be focused there. Please, Can I just mm -hmm. jump on, on the back of that? Because I think one point that may be helpful for a, 
for non-UK audiences, just to, to remind people, Nick, of the, the extent to which DFID you know, does hold the largest pot uh, of money um, in terms of promoting much of the direct health uh, benefits that you refer to here in the strategy. Um, and as you've pointed out in the past, I think again it's worth pointing out again, I mean, DFID's focus is quite specifically uh, on of the poorest of the poor. And therefore, this ability to link together a strategy that does, as you quite rightly mm. point out, bring in those middle, let's call countries, uh, uh, and yet an infrastructure that we have within the UK that perhaps is focused more heavily right now from a financial standpoint uh, on the poorest. I mean, how do you see this playing out? Or is that just a problem? And fair enough. No, I think that, uh, that Robin, you're absolutely right to highlight the, the difference. Um, if you think about global aid spend, or global health spend, where does it come from in the UK? Yes. Almost all of it comes from DFID. How much? Well, in last year's aid strategy, uh, DFID said that it would be spending around six billion over the next five years on global health, plus another million, another billion for um, the global fund. Now, if you look at the amount of money that the Department of Health or the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the state, you like, then it's really very, very much smaller. You know, it's. it's Several millions, but nothing like more, more, nothing like the amount that DFID spends. Um, and a number of people have asked me yesterday at various meetings, well, how do I think this plays out, and what's the significance? Well, I think that um, there was some anxiety from a number of quarters in DFID to so, say, well, where does this add value to what we're doing, and how does this this, this, this add to our approach? Um, and one of the nicer stories was a. Uh, the, head of the, the previous head of the profession came up to me and he said, you know, Nick, this has been an incredibly useful tool. I've had a, uh, a colleague in Canada who has used strong linkages between um, their work with poorest countries and health security issues back at home to articulate that in the economic downturn, they need to continue resourcing this sort of work. Um, but... I guess that the important thing here is that you have got a Department for International Development that, as you say, focuses on the poorest countries, and rightly so at the moment. You've got to have a clear strategy and a clear focus, um, and there are three white papers that are out there, and possibly a fourth one that will be developed um, fairly shortly, but um, here you've got the whole of government recognising that global health is more than just international development, the Millennium Development Goals, and poorest countries of the world. Yeah, one of the ways I think some of those strains will come together, as I read through the different parts of it, you know, um, you know one of the things I noticed, obviously, uh, uh, is the significant increase in support for product development partnerships, doubling of, of support um, as part of the research strategy. And if you combine that increased level of uh, support and numbers of product development partnerships being supported, with the, uh, the push for more affordable access to medicine. I think what you'll see is that many, certainly in, in PATH's experience, many of our product development efforts are increasingly harnessing the innovation capability of the emerging countries in, in China, India, Brazil, as good quality, low cost manufacturers of products. So you'll, you'll see, I think, um, turning to some of the emerging middle income countries as a source of innovation for producing the products that are affordable for the poorest of the poor. So I think some of the things that DFID is already doing are beginning to bring some of the strands of this together. I suspect we have maybe some good questions and comments in the audience. I can see already we do. That's great. Um, so what we'll probably do maybe is take them in groups of two and three. And please just um, identify yourself and your organization and which panelist you'd like to um, direct the questions to. So the gentleman in the third row here, please. Uh, Samuel Adeni Jones from U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, just two uh, quick questions. I want a little more clarification about what the Center of Global Health at Chatham House would do. Um, Chatham House is not a government organization, so it would be good to see how it fits into the young picture. Uh, the other one is a more practical uh, question. You have a lot of disparate groups that have their own funding within government and have their own strategy implement their own programs. The layers you have put up above them, 
what sort of power would they have to align what the people are already doing with what the struggling policies are? Thank you. Maybe in the white jacket here. Thank you. Uh, Carmen Valenzuela Dal from the Center for Health and Gender Equity, also known as CHANGE. This is uh, a question for Dr. Anat Bala. Um, we have uh, seen some analysis and uh, about the model of uh, the FID so as a model for for all of us. Ever since 2005, recently the heads of uh, the International Rescue Committee published a paper comparing the system of the UK versus the United States. My question is, have uh, the US authorities, specifically USAID, uh, have they approached the UK uh, authorities or DFID to, I don't know, to have some talks about this, to take uh, this as a serious, I don't know, possibility? Okay, and let's take maybe one other question in the front row here. Um, this, um, this question is for Dr. Benaval as well. Um, I, through my skimming of, you know, the document really briefly, it's a very um, ambitious strategy. And given that you, you mentioned that this has been many years in the works, um, taking into into account now the economic environment, um, how likely do you think it'll be that these priorities will actually be achieved? Are there priorities within these priorities? Do you think that, um, you know, in terms of reading some of the economic contributions that they're pledging, do you think those will come through? And could you just tell us who you are? I'm sorry, my name is Erin Condren from App Associates. Thanks. So why don't we start with that group of questions? Okay. Um, Shall I go first, and then you can do the chat house? Mm -hmm. Would that be reasonable? Uh, the first one was a little bit um, a, a, about the power um, in terms of how you're going to ensure that these people work together and whether you can have uh, this, this overarching strategy that will make people do things differently. My experience um, in the UK government suggests that actually people do want to work together, um, but that the default position is that they don't because they're so busy and because they just don't think about it. So I don't think that actually it's the lack of will. Very occasionally it is, but it's not usually. I think usually people do want to have as many people engaging in their things. So I think this is less about forcing people in power. It's about trying to alter that culture and trying to make people understand where each other's coming from. So to give you an example, it was very heartening at when DFID was developing its maternal health uh, strategy and having a stakeholder group, that they were inviting all sorts of partners from different um, government departments as well as uh, the NGOs and the academics involved. And there was a vigorous and robust discussion as to whether or not this should be a DFID maternal health strategy or this should be a government maternal health strategy. You know, whatever it turns out, it's, it's not, does, that doesn't matter so much as the fact that you're actually engaged in dialogue. So that's how I would sort of look at that. Um, with regard to the uh, DFID USAID access, actually there's a lot of uh, discussion that has been for many years between the two different uh, partners. It's particularly effective in the field. Um, and I've seen it myself when I was in Pakistan and elsewhere, where one plays to each other's strengths. Mm -hmm. USAID may have a particular strength or a particular ability to do something, or may politically not be able to do something, but could work in partnership with the UK government in another way. So I think in the field it works very well. I think at headquarters, um, it's, it again, you see many partnerships that get played out um, as one goes into big multilateral meetings, whether it's WHO, whether it's the Global Fund, or in uh, G8 meetings. So I think there's, you know, that there are significant linkages there. One of the uh, more interesting uh, ideas that I've been discussing with a few people this week is whether or not there is the opportunity to have a, uh, a joint uh, bilateral um, between a number of different government departments in the UK and in the US. Let's say Department of State, USAID, and uh, DHHS, and an equivalents back in the UK. And that would be challenging from both sides <laughs> who would be nervous about kind of uh, where they were going on that. But I think that's, that, that there's, there's a, 
quite a lot of interest there. The final thing is that it hasn't happened for the last few years, but there was a time where there were regular bilaterals between DFID and USA every year. Mm -hmm. One year in the US, mm -hmm. one year in the UK. Mm -hmm. Whether that needs to be re-established, mm -hmm. no, it's a very exciting time for you at the moment. It's a very exciting time for us because of what's happening to you at the moment. So there are all sorts of op options up for grabs. Finally, with regards to the economic downturn, yeah, big questions and big issues. The political line is very, very strong at the moment that our development budgets and our aid commitments are there and will not be undermined. We are still committed to getting to 0.7% over the next few years. Um, we were very strong supporters of uh, Margaret Chan's uh, um, discussion uh, just before the executive board in January, the event that was chaired by Richard Horton, mm -hmm. which had a number of different uh, members of the executive board standing up and speaking mm -hmm. up. And we were very strong. Liam Donaldson was a very strong uh, proponent of the fact that actually our uh, commitment to A, was not going to be undermined by this, but B, the importance of us as a member state saying that our commitment to mm -hmm. health within the UK and actually others as well should not be undermined uh, by this. And Margaret Chen is a really very strong believer that now is not the time to go soft um, and flabby on uh, our uh, domestic health commitments right across the globe. The final thing to say is that next week there is a uh, DFID-led conference which has been designed to run back-to-back uh, -back with the Chatham House event. So on Monday and Tuesday we have got the DFID event and on Tuesday and Wednesday we've got the Chatham House event. Uh, and that will be exploring exactly this. What is the new uh, script, if you like, for international development following the economic downturn? Yes, we may be committed to our, um, uh, our, our responsibilities and getting to 0.7%. Are others? What should we do about that? What's going to be the impact on the Indies and Chinas? What's going to be the impact on domestic health budgets of sub-Saharan African countries and other places? So big questions that need to be uh, answered. Yeah, um, very fair and a specific question about what is Chatham House going to do. Uh, and as you point out, we're not uh, a government department. Um, we are privately funded, like CSIS. Uh, we don't get any government subsidy uh, at all. Um, we do get some government grants for project work generally, uh, and uh, which we compete for with other universities or think tanks and so on. And in a way, this grant fits more in, in, in that kind of uh, a mold. Um, importantly, I think, uh, through our being able to set up the center of this grant, there's an opportunity for this vision to be seeded in a part of the British political debate that hopefully will persist and uh, persist beyond the comings and goings of ministers and, and, and governments. Um, we have pretty rapid turnover of ministers from different departments uh, from different setups in the US system. Um, and certainly from my perspective, uh, as the director of Chatham House, I see it always as a responsibility to make sure that this investment now uh, can be embedded not just within the institute, but within our work and be something that persists you know, indefinitely in, into the future. Um, you should know as well that very different in the UK from the US, my experience of American think tanks is they probably focus 95%, 90% on US policy, on, on what the US government should be doing, uh, and how it interacts, and, and improving that process, etc. And, and given the very open system of government that you have here, there are all sorts of avenues to do that very effectively. Um, the UK has, it strikes me, as somebody who's gone back to London from Washington, set itself a quite fascinating challenge of being a thought leader in all sorts of interesting global areas. Because ultimately, what Britain does can't by itself necessarily change the global context. But leveraging its vision, or its narrative, or its idea, um, the Stern Report, climate change, the very creation of DFID, and, and the very central role it has in the British government on British thinking about development approaches, uh, the health strategy, I, th I really see it as part of this sequence of, of ideas. Um, and therefore, the British government is very comfortable about being global and international in its outreach. And Chatham House probably does 85, 90% of his work is actually not focused on what the British government should do. It's on global strategy and international solutions. Because that, that's what you do from London, and ultimately that's what fits. 
So I think uh, we see as part of our mission, in essence, as therefore internationalizing partly the ideas that have been developed here in this document and also whatever we might develop in partnership with others who work in the health community, outside, who work nationally, who work internationally. Uh, and then to do all the usual stuff that policy institutes do, research, um, convening, catalyzing meetings, in particular what I said at the beginning, bridge building, uh, to get the people who really just don't see health as being relevant at all to what they're into in international affairs. And I could say it, there's plenty of people who want to know health and foreign policy have to do with each other, uh, still today, very much so. So um, bringing, you know, we've almost got to be at the other end of the telescope, I was saying this earlier to, to, to Lisa and others. We've got to be sitting at the end of people who don't think about health um, and be able to bridge over. There's plenty of people who think about health and security, uh, health and all sorts of international partnership from the health end. We've got to be sitting at, at completely the other end. Um, we will, back to your other point, probably reach out to some, you know, this, this shouldn't just be funded by the British government. So, you know, challenging times and all that. But in any case, uh, the idea is, is obviously to have it funded much more internationally, but also to, 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 to have visiting fellows from other parts of the world, from these middle income emerging countries, perhaps be based uh, at Chatham House. Uh, to have an advisory council that's more than British, you know, all the usual stuff that one might do at the institute and we can do in collaboration with CSIs and with others. Thanks, Rob. Let's take um, some more questions, please. Um, let's go maybe to the back over here, please. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Natasha Sikorsky and I'm with the International HIV AIDS Alliance. Thank you all for being here, taking the train in the snow and so on. Um, but my question is for Dr. Vanapala. You talked a little bit about the International Health Partnership, and I'm wondering how that will work um, in combination with bilateral efforts with other governments, um, particularly HEPFAR, for example. And then I'm also curious what the UK government position is on the currency transaction tax, the currency transaction levy that's similar to the aviation tax that would help support some of the achievement of Millennium Development Goals Thanks. Steve? Thank you very much. It's Steve Morrison, CSIS. Um, Nick, um, our experience here in the last few years looking at the President's Emergency Plan on AIDS Relief, you had agencies forced to cooperate with one another to a very significant degree because you had a White House that embracing this issue and driving it forward and empowering a coordinator to pull the pieces together. And the, you had the exceptionalism of HIV to sort of bring this forward. When I read this plan, you've got several powerful agencies and departments, ministries that you're asking to cooperate across a multitude of issues, not just one or two core drivers, but you're trying to be rather strategic and comprehensive in the approach. And these are, you know, your Ministry of Defense does not necessarily feel comfortable in, in all environments and cooperating with DFID and vice versa. And the, uh, power and control of resources is very concentrated in one or two of these. The FCO is probably deeply ambivalent if you, around some of these issues or certainly does, doesn't rank order them in the same way. But the question is, within, this, within your system, with this ambitious plan, Who's going to drive things forward and hold these parties accountable uh, in, the, in, in the next several years? Is it the Prime Minister's office? Is it one delegated uh, ministerial partner? I know you've allocated your five objectives across five, five different agencies or, or ministries, but who ultimately is responsible for driving this forward and holding the parties accountable? And let's take one more, please. The gentleman in the striped shirt. Hi, my name is James Hill. I'm with the Pan American Health Organization, which is the regional office of WHO in the Americas. My question has to do with non-communicable chronic diseases and engaging the private sector. Uh, we've just recently we had the visit of Dr. Alawan, who's uh, ADG from WHO and the new head of uh, non-communicable diseases, Fiona Adshead from UK. Uh, the question has to do with, uh, I agree that uh, I'm glad to see that there is some attention to chronic non-communicable diseases in the strategy uh, because 
I think that in the United States it's 75 percent of the bird disease, but even the developing countries it's becoming more like 55 percent. So this is the big challenge of the future, not, not so much infectious diseases. My question is, is to all of you, really, both uh, civil society and government, is that uh, I think in order to tackle con chronic diseases, we need to engage the private sector. Uh, and we have reached out to many companies. We've talked to the uh, Grocery Manufacturers Association. We've talked to the National Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. They're very interested in working in partnership with WHO on the issue of chronic diseases. The, the issue that we're grappling with, and I, I seek your advice on this, is there's a lot of initiatives in the private sector in health and wellness and in the workplace uh, that are already existing. They're looking to WHO to recognize these initiatives and to take that into account in promoting any kind of regional global strategy for chronic diseases. How, how can we do that without being seen as endorsing a product or a company? Uh, we by, by all means want to commend them for our efforts, but do we do it with an independent commission? Should WHO be directly involved? Should we defer it to the c civil society NGOs to take on that role? Thank you. Let's do one last question, the lady directly behind. Hi, I'm Erin Holfelder from the Sabin Vaccine Institute, and this is for Dr. Bonnet Bala. I was just curious to how you see this document evolving over the next five years, uh, particularly as the UK and other countries may reevaluate health priorities or as new disease issues may come up. For instance, uh, DFID recently made a 50 million pound commitment for the control of neglected tropical diseases, and I assume there may be other new uh, changes and innovations as well. So. Do you see this document as a static mission statement or something that may change and evolve uh, with shifting priorities? Thank you. So Nick, I think so again, like there are a few <laughs> from here. I think <laughs> others can help, but I think you have to take okay. the lead. Um, Natasha, you know, the International Health Partnership was, was born out of trying to make a reality of the, the Paris principles of aid effectiveness. Um, and one of the great, um, I think, Tributes has been that it's now moved very much from a UK initiative through to one that's being held and run by WHO and the bank um, and the AHA country um, uh, agencies. So um, I think that uh, I'm not going to stand up here and I'm not going to now start to either uh, to defend or promote the International Health Partnership as a UK initiative. The UK is a is a supporter of it, but the lead we now see clearly as coming from others um, outside. How will it work in the fullness of time? I don't know. Um, the fact remains that the coordination uh, of development assistance has been notoriously poor up till now. Uh, any efforts to try and enhance that and get that working better together and to get heads of agencies talking together has got to be a good thing. What we want to avoid clearly is having an uh, overarching bureaucracy, and I see you're nodding because that is the potential danger, with additional meetings, additional strategies, additional approaches. So we've got to be very wary about that. But I think we would all agree that having agencies trying to work together um, is increasingly uh, important. There was a uh, leader in the Lancet that came out, I think, at the end of January following that um, uh, meeting. Uh, in Geneva, the one that I uh, mentioned uh, just before the executive board, which said we now have an unprecedented opportunity with the economic downturn to think about the health architecture in terms of, if you like, mergers and acquisitions. How many mergers and acquisitions have there been over the years? Is this an opportunity to try and do that? Could the International Health Partnership provide a vehicle or a role for facilitating some of those impossibly difficult political discussions. Um, innovative financing schemes we talk about in this, uh, it runs into the same problem, that there is a Me Too approach to innovative financing, that every country wants its own approach. And they all have merits, and they all have disadvantages. And of course, every country will want everybody else to get involved and on, on, on the page as well. Um, and I think what we've got to be careful about yet again is complicating the, uh, the, the uh, organization and the structure of these as we build on those so that yet again we don't have different modalities. Uh, that's not decrying the opportunities that come from innovative uh, financing, many of which, as you know, the UK has, has, has promoted. 
Um, Steve, who drives all this? So it's a really good question. One of the uh, discussions that we had throughout was whether or not the Department of Health was the right agency to be leading on this, uh, both in its development and then further. Now, you could argue that it is, you could argue that it's not. There was some discussion as to whether uh, the Cabinet Office, which is, if you like, an overarching group, would be the right one for taking it forward. All I can say is at the moment, the lead is with the Department of Health, not in terms of delivering, but in terms of having a secretariat that will monitor and evaluate uh, this. So if you like to put this into very basic terms, what does that mean? It means that we uh, have developed with other government departments an action plan for making sure that each of these deliverables is developed. We will then hold those to account. We will then bring people together with the steering group and then with the interministerial group. Will it always be the Department of Health? I don't know. Should it always be Department of Health? I don't know, but that's where we are at the moment. But I think there is an understanding that it is the Department of Health that is leading on the coordination and bringing together of this. Um, but clearly, individual departments and the Department for International Development as the lead for, uh, for aid to developing countries is the lead in that area. Please, one of the things that people have said to me together, is this some sort of effort for the Department of Health to try and take over um, what DFID is trying to do? Is this some turf warfare? The answer is absolutely not, categorically not. So don't think that there is any sort of attempts with that. Um, the power who questions about non communicable diseases. You know, there are some things that we've got in this strategy which are so new and so difficult that I'm not sure that I necessarily have an answer to you in terms of how we're going to work effectively. Okay, we've given ourselves five years and we need to think through precisely the sort of questions because they're kind of tough questions in terms of how we're going to work with the private sector, how we're going to work with industry, how we're going to learn lessons about what we've been doing within the UK with other countries for the benefit of the UK but also with multilaterals for such as uh, WHO. I had some interesting discussions with the Fogarty Centre yesterday who were talking about some interesting initiatives they were trying to promote on non-communicable diseases where they were asking for partners to come forward for new working arrangements with other countries. And what was interesting is they said, we're not looking for uh, individuals that have a really strong track record in this because we don't think there are that many. So we're looking for people to put their hand up to start working in this area. So I think it's all up for discussion and anything you can contribute to that dialogue would be you know, w well received. Chris, yeah, maybe just I could just quick build point. on that because we've been doing a little bit of thinking about that at PATH. I think the good news about the chronic diseases um, is that um, in seeking new innovations for poorer countries, we're not, we have a greater opportunity to leverage the innovation of um, companies that are, are inventing for this, this country. So, you know, whereas malaria vaccines are primarily used, needed in the developing world, good um, medicines and approaches for um, uh, hypertension and heart disease, et cetera, are a shared. So I think we're going we're gonna to see the cost will be less in terms of, because we're not going to be developing new products where the markets have completely failed. We're going to be adapting products for less well-resourced health systems. So that's the good news. I think the other piece of good news is that we've learned a lot through the existing public-private partnerships about how to work with companies in a fair and balanced way by applying sort of a portfolio approach of where we're, we're you know, sort of uh, racing many horses at the same time, if you will. Um, and in particular, I think the WHO has an important role. We have at PATH now two what are essentially joint ventures with the World Health Organization for our meningitis vaccine project and the, the optimized project for strengthening the immunization cold chain where we have developed joint projects, joint governance of those projects with the World Health Organization. And when it's, um, and PATH is the international nonprofit partner, is the one working more closely with the comp companies. But then uh, through the partnership and joint planning with WHO, when we're country facing, um, we're able to use the, the credibility and, and in-country in resources of, of WHO and its offices. So I think there are some very interesting models that have been developed for infectious diseases in terms of public-private partnership that we can adapt for looking at chronic diseases as, as they become uh, higher priorities uh, for, co for countries as well as for international funding organizations. Just, just one 
uh, observation, I suppose, on Steve's comment, which is something maybe I, I could say something about, which is on the, on the political front and, and the governance of this and who drives it. And you, I thought it was a very important point you made about PEPFAR having this double focus of the presidential initiative and also focused on one um, particular issue. I think it's better to say that you know, the Department of Health in the UK, it, it's a big department. Um, it may not be as big internationally, but within the body politic of the UK, you know, the minister is an important secretary of state, is an important secretary of state within the cabinet office. Um, and to the extent that every ministry is increasingly uh, engaged in looking internationally, even if it's a smaller pointy part of its operations, this is you know, going to be the main focus and therefore it will live and will be a focal part for this particular department. Um, you put it in the cabinet office, you've got other departments to do it, they may be part of the mix, but it, you know, it, it could fall apart and fall under the waves as it is in everything, as we've talked about in this presentation shows, health at various levels, the central all sorts of aspects of, of national security, of international globalization, of, of international prosperity and security. So at, at least it strikes me that from a practical standpoint, uh, there's a logic to being where it is. I, I have no insight as to what the long-term mm -hmm. plans are, but I can see that would be quite logical. Uh, from I should just finish off the last question, yes. which was yes. asked. I'll ask you to finish off the last question, and since it's just about 11, maybe any closing thoughts um, that any of our group would, would like to leave? Please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the question from the uh, Vaccine uh, Institute about uh, will this go out of date, and how do you keep it up to date? Well. The difficulty with any document, as far as I see, is that as soon as it's published, it's immediately out of date. Um, whether that's a, you know, a, a strategy, a policy document, it's just the fact of life. I suppose you could say that if you publish things electronically, you can update them. But the, uh, the, the work of producing a new iteration is, that's going to be meaningful is significant indeed. So while that's going on, it's always going to be out of date. What I think that's kind of important about this document is the first thing is that there are a set of principles. And what I hope is that those principles won't change over the five years. Mm -hmm. What I also think that's worth looking through when you look at the, the strategy itself, there is um, a series of how we want to see the world looking in five years' time, the difference we want to see in five years' time. I suspect that probably we still will want to see that in five years. There will be different ways of getting to that, so you're absolutely right. Um, and to that extent, this is to a large extent an aspirational document. We are also clear, however, um, that we say on page 11 of the summary, we will use expert independent evaluations to assess progress and inform future iterations of the strategy. So it, isn't a, uh, it will not be a static uh, document. Uh, in terms of summing up and conclusions, I think I said quite enough today. So <laughs> it's all been very valuable. Robin, any thoughts? Uh, like I, I've got no particular additional thing to say. Just look forward to working um, with CSIS in particular, and uh, you and uh, Steve. And there's a huge amount to do. I mean, we're just we're at the front end of it from our perspective. Delighted to be working with Nick. And the final thing I'd say is, you know, good luck, because I think it's, for, it's an ambitious plan and an ambitious task, and it's potentially a very important model. So um, I'm wishing you success because I think there's some lessons we could learn here if it succeeds, when it succeeds. And actually, I liked <laughs> very much um, Nick, the way Nick des described the document just in those last few sentences as an aspirational document because I think this actually is a time when we all need to be aspiring to things that are even bigger and better that, than what has already been accomplished. And um, my hope is that we find in this document and we find in U.S. strategies as they evolve areas where we can collaborate all the more closely. Um, so I want to thank our audience, but I'd also ask our audience to join me in thanking our panelists um, for a great discussion this morning.